Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Now let's look at the scientific world image in some detail. The scientific world image as I said consists of concepts, a number of which might not have a real life existence in contrast with the real world. Now the best way to understand the scientific world image is by contrasting it with the world of experience, which the real the scientific world image is trying to address all the time. But the heart of the matter is that the scientific world image does not exist by itself. It exists in order that it is able to explain the world of experience. In short, the scientific world image is a functional world. It exists because of the functional necessity of human beings to construct a strict idea of causality which world image alone can give. Which means basically that the credibility of the world image depends upon how it tallies with the world of experience. I repeat, a scientific idea exists so that it can exp explain the world of experience, but the scientific idea itself is credible only to the extent that its explanation of the world of experience is credible. If for example, there is a particular experience which we are trying to describe, say the experience of a monsoon which we are trying to explain through some hydrological scientific language. If one simply says as an explanation in the world image of this experience, suppose we say it is 5a plus 6b equals 12c, it might make sense within the world image, but it makes no sense with the world of experience. But that 5a plus 6c equals, I am sorry, 6b equals 12c itself has meaning only as long as it translates itself into a meaning in the world of experience which is meaningful. So, let us go one step further and look at a problem of credibility which faced me most of the time when I was a learner of economics. In fact, I should be honest, I stopped being a learner in economics the moment I stopped feeling this question as a serious question. When my teachers used to say something like the elasticity of demand is 0.75, I used to say all right, you measure something and you measure something and you compare the rates of change and you get 0.75 is a result, that is fine. But what is elasticity of demand? I do not have an elasticity of demand inside me when I go to the shop. In other words, the language did not make sense to me in terms of my experience. One step further, this was the problem when I, this is the stage at which when I started getting into pointless arguments with my fellow students and sometimes with the teachers. This is the time when I, when for instance, suppose I heard the law of demand said that there is an inverse correlation between the quantity demanded and the price, which simply meant that you bought less when the price rose and you bought more when the price fell. Then I invent situations where people would buy more when the price rose, I would say, look, people buy it because it is status. 
people buy a costly thing because it is status, then immediately the economist will come and say, but that is an exception. Then I say, how do you know it is an exception? The whole society buys costly things because it is status. Everybody is buying costly things not because of any other reason except that they can talk about it to others saying I paid 1000 rupees to buy this. The only people who do not spend money on costly things to demonstrate are people who cannot afford it. So, I so it say every person in the society from the small man to the big man loves to demonstrate, loves to show off and one way is they like, they like to show off is the show off their relative opulence. So, if I am a small time pune, I would probably take something to my office which is 5, 600 rupees worth saying I bought it. If I am a, if I am a big man then probably say I will probably buy a diamond brooch to my wife and make her wear it to all the brats and parties so that she can demonstrate my opulence to the world. In short, I would argue everybody seems to be interested in buying costly things precisely because they are costly and people say, no, no, but that is an exception to the law of demand. So, I would not ever understand why this was an exception when such large number of people did it. Right? Much later, when I started looking at institutional economics, a lot of it made sense to me, but not in the early days when I had my wars with the law of demand. I am just giving you an illustration to show how the credibility of scientific, image, scientific world image rested heavily on how they explained the world of experience. I showed you some illustrations of how, how I had problems, but more generally if there is a law in economics which tells you something which is completely uh, ruled out in the world of experience either statistically or otherwise then that law would not exist as simple as that. For instance, there was this whole business in the time of Stanley Jevons I think when people were trying to talk of correlation between sunspots and the harvest of corn. When there are x number of sunspots and the, this is what happens to the harvest of corn and so forth. Well, you know it is to say the least far fetched. So, how far fetched such a notion is, is a way of saying the science is no good. So, one of the crucial aspects of science is its continuous informal verification against the world of experience. Now, this is where the whole dynamics of science begins. As I said, the world of experience is generated and presented in a scientific form to the scientists through statistics and through other quantitative techniques which might describe behavior of not just human beings, but behavior of phenomena in general. So, statistical verification of a hypothesis in science becomes a crucial part of research. All scientific research then is nothing but verification either of the logical coherence of scientific propositions or of the statistical credibility of these propositions. There is no research outside of these two. A lot of piece, lot of research try to do both. They examine a proposition logically and say okay, through this proposition there are these questions emerge logically and therefore, a third proposition emerges logically. Let us verify that statistically. So, that is a statistical come coherence verification kind of measure. So, a lot of research is of this type continuously verifying the credibility in a statistical, statistical sense. Outside of economics for instance in social sciences in subjects like ethnography, social sociology, social anthropology statistical credibility of a hypothesis is not a very important thing if you can produce evidence from field, if you can produce evidence from field about the behavior of somebody in the field doing something, something which questions the validity of a sociological hypothesis that is good enough. To give you an example, I hope you remember the argument of Max Weber about religion and the spirit of capitalism, Protestant ethics and the spirit of capitalism. 
where he argued that there was a strong correlation between places where Protestant ethics spread and the places where capitalist enterprise was growing. In other words, he was drawing a correlation between religion and capitalism. And then Weber went on to say that oriental religions like Hinduism did not have that positive correlation and therefore, they were not in favor of industrialization and capitalism. Now, how do you verify this? A great verification was done in the 1960s by a, an American sociologist called Milton Singer. He came down and settled down in Madras for two years or God knows how many years and started studying Tamil entrepreneurs, how they behaved, what was the entrepreneurial activity they were involved in and how. He was checking whether they were Hindus, had anything to do with what they did in their business enterprise. Whatever it is, he had his own conclusions and he said that well, what is happening here is something which Weber, which proves that Weber is not correct. You can have an oriental religion and still have efficient business, successful business, etcetera. That is a different issue, but what is of importance to us here is to show that in sociology, statistical credibility of this verification is not so important. An empirical case study is good enough. So, it depends upon the subject, it depends upon the science concern. In biomedical statistics for instance, uh, the, the size of the sample would be so, sam sm so small that an ordinary statistician would be awestruck. For instance, to study whether a particular drug has a particular effect, you would probably have about 20 samples and 20 controls that is 20 cases outside of that sample to see whether this is working now the total sample size of say 40. Now, at the end of the study a paper might be produced which might get published in a very high level medical journal based on this kind of statistics, but an ordinary statistician might say now what is credible about 20, should you not have 200, there are so many patients with this disease, what about 20, but then people will say there are a lot of problems in hospitals and where these people came and where this data are available etcetera, etcetera. Whatever it is, the long and short of it all is the word, the word statistical credibility is a varied word and it has different meanings, but what is important is to note that whatever science it is, the world image constantly rests on its credits only by continuous verification empirically by which is mostly meant statistically. Is okay? Now, so what does research mean in science? In science research usually means anticipating something. Most of scientific propositions or hypotheses are based on certain parametric understanding. For example, in economics you say when price rises, demand falls, ceteri paribu, other things remaining the same. You can change the other things about and verify what happens to demand as price falls. No? Fashions change, traveling distance increases, a number of you can, you can bring in a lot of external changes and then see what happens to this law of demand, is not it? This is research. In other words, there are initial conditions under which a particular phenomenon is supposed to happen in the scientific world image. Most of the times you change the initial conditions, assumptions about initial conditions and see what happens to the hypothesis about the phenomenon. Most of research is like this. Then what happens is you keep adding to the corpus, vast corpus of knowledge of the subject by basically adding punctuations to existing concepts, existing scientific world image. For instance, if you have discovered that a certain kind of uh, inferior good behaves in a particular way in a model, then you say the law of demand subject to the condition of inferiority of good in the following way, etcetera, 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 that becomes a paper or a PhD thesis or whatever and that is your research and that gets added to the corpus of knowledge in the sub by subject by saying so and so, so and so and all these people have said this about the law of demand, but this piece of research says comma also this. So, most of scientific research is adding to the corpus of scientific knowledge by 
basically assuming changes in initial conditions. What this does is that this essentially confirms existing scientific knowledge by saying that in these exceptions this is what happens therefore, this is true in a more general sense. Right? So, here is what we come to learn about paradigms. All hypotheses are born out of a certain basic theoretical ideas on which most of the scientists are formulating their work. These basic scientific ideas themselves are a product of a great path breaking work in the past. And this path breaking work has created a basic a new scientific tradition which is being followed today right and this scientific tradition has what is called its paradigm that's the dominant analytical model so a writer like thomas kuhn history of scientific revolution tries to tell you that most sciences rest on paradigms and paradigms are continuously threatened and questioned by verifications Right? So, most as I have just now told you most sciences have a built in defense mechanism. Constantly scientists are encouraged to do research on changing initial conditions and studying what happens to the scientific phenomena under consideration. Now, this kind of research is what I call hedge trimming research. It is hedge trimming because the hedge is already there. You keep trimming it to different shapes right. The theory, the paradigm is already there. You keep trimming it in different shapes, basically doing two things. One, improving the flexibility of the hedge, it can get into different shapes. And more importantly, in confirming the hedge itself, that you do not need any other plant other than this, but if you keep on trimming it, you can get any shape. So, this kind of research which I call hedge trimming research is a research which confirms and affirms a paradigm. 9 out of 10 activity, activities of research are of this type. Occasionally, a particular scientist starts into a, an area of research either wittingly or unwittingly, which starts questioning the very basis of a hypothesis which starts questioning on the very foundations of a paradigm. And then the statistical verification and everything go on and the questioning becomes deeper and more profound till such time as the whole scientific world image surrounding a particular paradigm is shaken very badly. Now, the scientific world does two things when this happens. One, they look the other way. They look the other way saying, well look he has done this work, but you know all that exists is so important, so valid, so much research has been done and what is going on it has involved so many laboratories, so much of funding, so many scholars, so many this, we cannot shake all that. In other words, this is an establishment view. What I am trying to argue is any earth shaking work in science which ends up consciously or unconsciously, wittingly or unwittingly questioning a paradigm is fundamentally seditious. It is fundamentally seditious because it shakes up an establishment. It has a political role unwittingly or wittingly and triggers a political response. One. Second, more importantly, there is an attempt in the large body of science to incorporate this. X has said that this does not work. So, let us see under what conditions that this will work. So, incorporate the critical work which shakes up, shakes up the paradigm in such a manner that it is absorbed into the paradigm as a very special case or as an exception and so forth. Right? In that case, you have converted the seditious work into a work which confirms the establishment. So, this means an adaptation of the scientific concepts. So, you create a whole lot of hedge trimming activities in this direction. right? So, 
when there is a fundamentally radical work, a revolutionary work which threatens a paradigm, the first response of the paradigm is to adapt, is to adapt to this threat. And either the paradigm adapts, its, adapts itself in such a manner that substantively it remains the same, but formally it, accom it accom accommodates the fundamental questioning of the work, then what happens is paradigm goes richer and stronger and more extensive in its capabilities. And in consuming this seditious work, the paradigm has grown stronger. So, what is happening here is a selective selection process. As in the case of species in nature, there are scientific ideas and ideas and ideas and ideas which constitute an existing set of selection, a particular set of area of a particular area of research, a particular set of hypotheses get confirmed by the establishment and this view goes on till some fundamental work which occurs questioning these. And when the questioning happens, the response of the establishment is to adapt, adapt and adapt in such a manner as this, this questioning is assimilated. If it is not assimilated, then a suitable rejoinder must be produced, which rejects this seditious activity. In other words, this is the argument of Kuhn. When a paradigm is fundamentally questioned, it results in the credibility of the paradigm, in the sense in which we have talked about it earlier. What happens then? is that a new work sets off a process of change which results in a very change of paradigm itself. Then a new scientific orthodoxy is born, a new paradigm is created and Kuhn says this is how scientific revolutions happen. I am saying it slightly differently. I am saying it may or may not happen. What happens here is that a seditious activity in science sets up an adaptive response in the routines of research, in the routines of teaching, right, which the scientists are absorbed in. Please note that I am using evolutionary language here by talking of routines, because all teaching is nothing but routines of creating thought patterns in students. And these thought patterns are things which are part of the establishment of science. <coughs> And these are based on routines of research, which have created bodies of knowledge in science, which are meant to be taught. So, the whole of the science rests on particular routines of research, particular routines of teaching, all of which contribute to the establishment in science, to a particular paradigm. So, when a particular paradigm is under question, when a particular scientific orthodoxy comes under fire with new research, as I said, the protest does not take the form of an attempt to repress the questioning. The response is actually much more survival oriented. It is to assimilate, accommodate and adapt, so that the new questioning is also taken in without the establishment being fundamentally shaken. In other words, I am saying that there is an evolutionary process involved here in slight variation with Kuhn and others. I am saying that it is only when a particular body of knowledge cannot adapt itself to change anymore, that it results in something new, that it results in something fundamentally different, a new paradigm. So, by the time a new paradigm comes, <coughs> a long attempt, long series of attempts at adaptation and modification have been tried to assimilate and accommodate. When this is not possible, the revolution does happen. To me, the selection process is like selection of populations in a very Darwinian system. There is an external challenge here in the, in the world image of science, the external challenge is statistical credibility. 
see what is happening is the world image is very static in the sense that it is a given set of propositions which are designed only for logical coherence is not it. Now, for instance when you postulate elasticity of demand in a particular way and state it in terms of first order differential conditions, you are doing it because it is the most coherent way of doing it right. To state that d, d by d p where d is demand and p is price as a particular inverse correlation you are stating the relationship in demand and price in a very tight rigid statement of coherence. So, the rigidness of the statement of coherence is the heart of the scientific world image and because it is so rigid as a text it is very inflexible whereas, human experience is continuously dynamic. Human experience is nothing but dynamic. So, there is a fundamental structural this is my argument there is a fundamental structural contradiction in the very structure of the building of the knowledge between the world of experience and the world of I mean world of world images. World images are fundamentally texts whose validity is in the tight knit argument of the text. The world of experience is one where there is no text which can bound them which can limit them it is continuously dynamic and full of uncertainties, full of new things, novelties. So, there is a fundamental contradiction between in human condition between the world of experience and scientific world image, not just scientific world, world image in a very loose sense talking of even the way we speak. So, the world image is compelled to adapt continuously, constantly, continuously adapt to the continuous dynamism of change which the world of ex experience is pushing on it. So, as I say knowledge is an evolutionary process, knowledge is a process where there is continuous adaptation to change to external pressure and when adaptation fails a particular body of knowledge falls apart and a new body of knowledge comes into existence and when this happens yes that is when Kuhn's paradigmatic revolution takes place. But my argument is there is a long long way to go before such paradigmatic revolutions do happen because establishment tries adaptation, 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 adaptation till you cannot survive anymore till only the rival survives. So, there is an evolutionary basis to this as I argue. Now, when this happens when adaptation is no longer possible, then an existing paradigm is replaced by a new paradigm. What does this mean? A new establishment is born. The new paradigm becomes the basis of a new orthodoxy and this new orthodoxy becomes the basis of a new establishment and another set of head streaming activities start around the new paradigm for generations till something else happens somebody questions it somewhere some fundamental work comes up some somewhere which questions the very basis of the paradigm again attempts at adaptation assimilation if they succeed then the fundamental question is assimilated if they do not succeed then there is yet another paradigmatic revolution. So, my submission in the social construction of knowledge in general and science in particular is that Kuhn's revolutions do not happen that easily. There is a considerable evolutionary process involved and Kuhn's revolution is only one stage in the evolutionary process when a particular species is knocked out as unfit for survival and something is selected in its place. So, if you look at it in an evolutionary fashion what is important is to see how adaptation is happening all the time. Now, in what remains of the time I shall illustrate all this with economics. I shall first use the case of Marxism, then I shall bring in Keynes as two different examples. <coughs> what Marx was doing was he was questioning 
the idea of perpetuity of a capitalist economy as a bliss of efficiency. In other words, Marx was saying that the capitalist economy is a historical entity and like all historical entities it comes and it must go. And in that again, he was merely stating the case of Ricardo very beautifully. A lot of Marx's economics is Ricardian economics in the sense that it is Ricardo who actually was the early predictor of the crisis of capitalism. The falling rate of profits which is so crucial to the crisis of capitalism is first in Ricardo. And so, the Ricardian economics is stated very beautifully by Marx in his writing. But eventually, Marx in economics acquires credibility as a rival paradigm of not the validity of capitalism, but of the very nature of capitalism. So, Marxism comes under question, Marxism questions a whole paradigmatic structure of classical and neoclassical economics, which the Marxists call bourgeois economics. And the politics of it is so clearly illustrated that where Marxists come to power, Marxian economics comes to power paradigmatically. Where Marxists do not come to power, Marxian economics does not come to power paradigmatically. In short, there is an innate, para, innate para, pragmatism in Marxists when they say that they must capture power in order that the transformation is effective. Capturing power is not only a precondition, but is the very process of transformation according to Marxists. So, the political nature of the scientific revolution is inherent in the very way Marxists look at change. So, when Marxists came to power in Soviet Union by 1920-21, they redefined a whole lot of disciplines including psychology. For instance, the idea which was most popular with Marxists was behavioralism of Pavlov. Have you studied Pav about Pavlov's dog? Behavioral psychology says all learning is conditioned reflex. So, the best example of that as Pavlov showed was a dog which was put in a cage or wherever and it was fed at a particular time every day and the dog salivates when it sees the food. Then for a few days each time the food is presented to the dog a bell is rung and then the dog salivates and after a while there is no food only the bell is rung and the dog salivates. And by this they prove that salivation is a conditioned reflex. They say then all learning is conditioned reflex. Now, Pavlovian psychology became immensely popular under the Soviets in the first two decades of their rule for the simple reason that it was believed that the whole population had to be conditioned in and educated in socialist thinking and socialist behavior. So, socialist psychology should not be bourgeois psychology, it should not be like Freud which talks of you know sexuality and so forth which is all bourgeois degeneracy according to Marxists. So, Pavlovian psychology became immensely important. Likewise, legal systems had to be adopted. It was considered that marriage at least in the first few years of the third decade of the century that is from 19, 1920 onwards. In a number of Soviet cities, it was thought that marriage is a bourgeois institution whereby one becomes a property of the other. So, you cannot have that bourgeois institution. People should just live together without such bourgeois trappings. So, people just live together and a vast number of children were produced by this living together who had serious identity problems say 20 years down the line when they had to look back and say who were their parents. Nobody knew they were born and they were brought up by some home or something because their parents produced the children and left them somewhere. It was not part of marriage, part of family because family was a bourgeois institution. 
So, what I am trying to say is that whole paradigm of existence came into existence with the coming into power of the Soviet Union. Right? Now, unfortunately or fortunately the rise of the Soviet power itself was a very subtle question of the writings of Marx. Now, Isaiah Berlin who is probably the greatest biographer of Marx ever says this about Lenin's revolution in Russia. He says, where did Lenin learn his lessons from about making revolution in Russia? Certainly, he did not learn from Marx, because in Marx's writing capitalism is hardly exists in Russia. There is hardly any major industrialization in capital, Russian capitalism. Whereas, in Germany and Britain capitalism was substantially advanced. So, the kind of contradictions of capitalism which should develop between the working class and the capitalists existed a lot more in Germany than in Russia. So, Isaiah Berlin says certainly therefore, Marx did not teach Lenin how to make a revolution, because there was no, no lesson for Russia from Marx. So, where did Lenin learn it? So, according to Isaiah Berlin, Lenin learnt it from the secret societies of pre-revolution France, the Jacobins. He said they were the early secret societies which knew how to organize, organize clandestine groups, clandestine organizations with a particular ideal and then how to successfully make a revolution which the Jacobin structure did in France. So, according to Isaiah Berlin, there were Jacobins of Russian variety like people Peter Kachev, who were Russian Jacobins in the sense 19th century Russians who believed in the Jacobin philosophy of overthrowing the Tsar and making a revolution etcetera. So, according to Isaiah Berlin, it is people like Kachev and the Russian Jacobins who taught Lenin how to make a revolution in Russia and not Marx. Fundamental issue because Berlin says the crisis of capitalism which should lead to revolution existed more in Germany than in Russia, because capitalism did not exist that much in Russia. So, this means that even in doing his revolution, Lenin had broken the boundaries of Marxian understanding of revolutionary situation and very true, because Lenin made his revolution not as a workers revolution in Russia. He called it the Smitschka. Smitschka is a Russian vehicle with three horses drawing it. It is drawn by three horses and it is called Smitschka. He says there are three horses which draw the Russian revolution. One the workers, another the peasants and the third the soldiers. So, the Bolshevik party created discontent in the name of revolution in these three segments of Russian society and created the mass base for revolution. So, already Leninism had challenged Marxism as a paradigm. See what I mean? Uh, which is why later day, the by the 1930s, Marxists were talking about not Marxism, but Marxism Leninism. Right? Here is a classic case where Marxism as a paradigm adapted, adapted became Marxism Leninism. By 1940s, Mao had successfully conducted his revolution in China, not Smitschka, but entirely peasants. Entirely peasants. There were no working class in Chinese revolution, there was no soldiers. The soldiers were actually people's liberation army, which were selected from the peasants. So, there was not even an excuse of a Smitschka with Maoists, but still Comintern, Com Communist International had to adapt the paradigm, it cannot simply say it is irrelevant. So, they said Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. So, you can see in the history of Marxism, this adaptive process it very, is very much at work. Right? This adaptation goes on and on, on and on till a man like Gorbachev comes up and says you cannot adapt anymore. You have gone so far away from, from your ideals that the system is breaking down. So, he talks of something else, he talks of perestroika. 
but you talk of perestroika, you are basically dismantling the system. So, that finally, Soviet Marxism, Leninism dismantled itself as a logical consequence of its own actions of the past. But what is important here is to see adaptation at work in the paradigm of Marx. Let us now look at another example that of Keynes. When Keynes was writing, there were three or before Keynes started writing, there are three fundamental assumptions in economics. One that markets always deliver. The free market economy is the only solution to social welfare. That is from Adam Smith onwards. And the theoretical foundations of Walrasian economics and Marshall in economics and Say's economics confirmed that theoretically this is so. And the next was people were rational and it is this innate rationality of people combined with their hedonism which ensured that this invisible hand worked. Right? By the time Keynes started writing in the 1920s, these things came under question from the world of experience. From the world of experience, it was found that from the later half of 19th century onwards, market mechanism was not working as theory predicted it would work. According to theory, as we have seen already, the automatic adjusting mechanism in classical economics lay in the flexibility of wages and prices. So, when there is an external shock, wages and prices move and make adjustments so that the system is restored to an equilibrium. We have seen how this happens. We have also seen that as a matter of experience in the last quarter of 19th century, wages and prices became more and more rigid across Europe. So, this automatic adjustment mechanism because more became more and more difficult to defend. So, by the time Keynes was writing, people had come to understand that this there was something that had to change. Second, when Keynes was writing, one of the very backbones of the classical system of thinking, gold standard had collapsed. Now, gold standard existed when all the countries accepted that their money was measured in terms of a particular quantity of gold, gold and therefore, money supply was regulated according to the stock of gold in the country. This rested on very strict discipline on the part of the governments in maintaining the gold to money supply ratio, so that exchange ratios, ratios were stable. When exchange rates fluctuated due to balance of trade differences, transfer of gold would ensure that prices would be at par and therefore, international equilibrium persisted. This went on okay up to the first world war. In the first world war as we saw, British government had to be profligate, they had to spend oodles of money in the conduct of war. Where did the money come from? The printing press. So, by the end of the war, Britain had considerably per force mismanaged its monetary system. The British pound was vastly overvalued in terms of gold at the end of the war. So, the British government set about trying to re-establish gold standard and Keynes wrote to say that what has happened is a fundamental macroeconomic disorder. You cannot simply restore gold like that, it will be a chaos and it turned out to be that. So, what I am trying to say is that the credibility of the theoretical apparatus had been questioned by the world, ex world of experience in a very fundamental way. The writings of Keynes offered an alternative paradigm which, ex which explained the world of experience more lucidly, more credibly. In the first place, Keynes assumed very clearly and stated very clearly that unaided, uninterrupted market mechanism is useless. You have to think in terms of the government as an active intervener in the system to sustain the very market process. This changes the fundamental assumptions. Second, Keynes said people are not rational. People's behavior in the investment market follows animal spirits. They invest money 
on the basis of how they judge the market to be in terms of their confidence levels in the markets. In other words, some irrational confidence factor which fundamentally influenced in investment decisions and therefore, the marginal efficiency of capital and so on and so forth. In short, investment was a fundamentally irrational or a non-rational activity which Keynes called animal spirits, which was at the back of every economic crisis. So, it is the irrationality of economic actors or non-rationality of economic actors which Keynes accepts as a reality and designs a toolkit suited to accept this and then carry on and making adjustments in the economy. So, in a very fundamental sense, when Keynes talks of consumption expenditure as a function of income and investment as being autonomous of that, he is talking very realistically about the fact that it is expenditure decisions which are crucial in the country and not as say says production decisions. According to say, when you produce something and market it automatically you create a demand. Keynes says no, it is expenditure decisions which are crucial which determine the demand in the market level of effective demand and that determines how much is produced, it is the other way around. And Keynes proves this in a world of non-rational human beings through his toolkit. So, what is Keynes in economics? It is a huge paradigmatic shift. It is a huge paradigmatic shift in terms of all three factors which were mentioned as the underlying premises of classical economics. And Keynesian economics gets accepted eventually, universally without any question, of course, without with the exception of Chicago and uh, Milton Friedman who remain staunch anti Keynesians right through for years afterwards. But the fact remains that Keynesian economics gets accepted otherwise universally. So, Keynes then is a fundamental paradigmatic revolution in economics in a very Kuhnian sense. At the same time, this revolution does not happen very peacefully. For nearly 20 years, there are attempts at continuously synthesizing Keynesian economics with classical economics. The whole of the ISLM models which you study in macroeconomics is nothing but attempts to marry the two. Eventually by the 1970s monetarism as an alternative theoretical view replaces the significance of both Keynesian and the classical Keynesian synthesis models. So, what we are looking at here is not just a revolution, but continuous attempts at adaptation, classically adaptations. Now, more recently with the coming into existence Obama's economic policies, it appears that there is a revival of interest in Keynesian policies particularly towards government spending large volumes of money. So, we are seeing here illustrations of the way that things work. First paradigmatic revolutions, then adaptation of existing establishment paradigms and sometimes when a paradigmatic revolution seems to have exhausted its energies, it gets a revitalized source of energy subsequently and it seems to get a new charge of life. In short, it is an evolutionary political process. What we have done so far is to go through a quick resume of what we have done in this course. I have tried to show that the evolution of theory in economics is very highly subject to historical conditions, ideological conditions and the way the very process in which selection goes on in the emergence of scientific ideas. To illustrate this, we looked at the way scientific ideas are born, scientific ideas are sustained and scientific ideas get transformed and adapted. We came to the conclusion that it is a highly evolutionary process. We came to the conclusion that it is a political process aided by evolution and therefore, science is positively a social construct all the time. Thank you.